Bible's going to be. The scripture today is, comes from the 20th chapter of John. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't, do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciples set out and went toward the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there, and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture, that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white, sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. The word of God for the people of God. Does anyone have a phrase that they live by? A mantra that they would claim as their own? Something you put on a bumper sticker? I've been using the one, all shall be well, lately. Well, since March, a lot. <laughs> all shall be well. At the 9 o'clock service, we heard the golden rule as a good uh, bumper sticker, right? Love your neighbor as you, as you love yourself. Any other ones that you think of? Julie, you've got one there. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can do all things all things through Christ who strengthens me. Thank you. That was my senior quote in my yearbook. Awesome. Yeah. This too shall pass. This too shall pass. Yes, that is a mantra for sure to live by. Uh, ben. Live a life of integrity. Live a life of integrity. I like the look of that bumper sticker. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Well, along the same line, would there be a way in which you could summarize the goal or purpose of following Christ? If you were to explain this to an alien who came here, again, sort of bumper sticker size, what would it, what would it be about? Judy, yeah. Now, man shall not wear that by every word of God. You shall not live by bread alone, but by the word of God. Thank you, yeah. And says, keep breathing. Keep breathing. Thank you for looking at our chat on Zoom. Apologize, Zoom folks, but thanks for using your chat. That's great. There's, there's several <clears throat> phrases that we might claim. Um, on any given day, we might need to claim a different one, right? 
So I want to ask a final question that we might ponder uh, for the rest of today, and that is, what does it look like to live these phrases? To live the phrases, like, live a life of integrity, all shall be well. What does it look like to live it? When I turned 16, uh, I was lucky enough to receive a car from my parents, and I wanted to make it my own. So I went to the local Christian bookstore, grabbed a few new CDs to use in my new CD player, and also one of those Jesus fishes. You know what I'm talking about? The, the little symbol. It was simple, it was small, it was clean. It was silver, and it fit really nicely on my silver Subaru, and I set it there. And I was like, this is mine. I'm, I'm good to go. And then, for the next 16 years, I was always reminded it was on my car. Oh my gosh, are people watching me drive and think this is what Christians are about? Are they that selfish? Are they that bad of drivers? All of a sudden, this symbol was something that I was reminded of meant something, and it meant something even when I was driving. I, I claimed that symbol, right? I brought it into my life, but there was a lot of responsibility that came along with it. So our words, our slogans, our symbology matter, but only to the point that they point back to our lives. I think our lives have the capacity of saying and being what we are wanting to portray in our words and in our symbols. Last week we explored how the Apostle Paul told his story of his encounter with Christ and that others were so drawn to his story that they wanted to have their story be encountered and transformed by Christ. He testified to love and he reaped a harvest as people came to know Christ over and over and over again. Today we're going to discover how the first evangelist, the first disciple to the disciples, the first witness to the risen Christ, testified to love and lived it. Mary Magdalene told others about the goodness of Christ Jesus and thus discovered a new responsibility, action, joy, and ways of generosity. That's where we're headed. Would you pray with me? God, we pray for the words that we have, the mantras we live by, the symbols we claim. And we ask that, just like the scriptures say, your word might be more than bread, that it might be more than uh, just a sustenance, but that it might be the fuel that energizes our very actions. We pray all of this, that the words that I share, the meditations that are on our hearts, the reflections that we take into the next week, might not only glorify you, but give us a way of being transformed in you, that we might live more like Christ each and every day. We pray this now in your holy name. Amen. Mary Magdalene has had a prominent place in our Christian uh, story and history. And Mary Magdalene seems to hold and bear so much, like every idea of what femininity is about. Uh, she holds devotion. She holds on to the ideal of helplessness or the connection to Jesus. Mary Magdalene is often conflated as every female character in the scriptures. We sometimes hear that Mary Magdalene is the person who is a prostitute. She might be the woman who cried and wept so much that she washed Jesus' feet and then dried them with her hair. We could hear that she was the one who was the adulterer or the one who came alongside Jesus at the tomb. What we do know is that Mary Magdalene was from a place called Magdala. And even though the centuries have given her all of these roles to hold, 
Recent biblical scholars of the last decades have found that much of it is not true. It's just not in, in, the, in the Word, in the Bible. And so instead, they're giving uh, Mary Magdalene, again, her significance where it needs to stand. As a companion to Jesus in his life. As a woman from, with an epitaph, we are often reminded that that can give us a sense of position or power or status. Think of the you know, Duke of Edinburgh or so-and-so from such and such a place, right? When we know where someone is from, somehow they, re they receive a status. And the same is true of Mary Magdalene. Um, some scholars believe that she was actually a widow that had quite a bit of wealth. And so part of her companionship with Jesus was as a financial resource. She, along with Susanna and Joanna, helped the ministry of Jesus financially. But she took her life um, and her connection with Jesus much more seriously than just writing checks. She took it in a way that she lived it. For the thing we do know about Mary is she was healed by Jesus. She was the one with many demons, seven demons, and she was healed by Jesus, and she testified to that love she experienced by living it out on a regular basis. She was a constant companion of Jesus. She was one of the few who stayed with him at the cross on that torturous Good Friday. She helped bury him in the tomb and was the first one there on Sunday morning to honor his body with spices. Even she beat even the brothers there. And she was the one who told the disciples he was gone. She was a faithful servant and a leader, an essential companion for this radical leader in Jesus. She was there in the hard times and she remained in the good times as well, embracing the responsibility of her, pro her proximity as well as her position. She recognized what was good at hand. Mary Magdalene supported Jesus and his ministry in what was described by the women's Bible commentary as a spiritually astute dialogue partner. A spiritually astute dialogue partner. Right, she's more than just someone who's like, coffee or tea, right? She is someone who Jesus can confide in, who knows who will be there in the thick of it all, and can bounce ideas off. What a gift to a leader who experienced life in, in such a lonely way. The morning at the empty tomb, Mary Magdalene wept, for she couldn't find Jesus' body. The gardener asks, what are you looking for? And this is the same question that Jesus asked back in the first chapter of John. I love the gospel writer John because he always plays with these words, these connections. Right after Jesus is baptized, the disciples that he's named are kind of hovering around. What is this guy all about? And Jesus says, what are you looking for? And they respond, teacher. He says, come and follow me. And so here now, outside the tomb, Mary is looking, looking for her Jesus. And he says, what are you looking for? And she says, oh, I'm looking for Jesus. The intimate naming of Mary calls her to say, teacher. And then we hear Jesus say something magnificent. He says, don't cling to me. Now, if you were to see someone that had perished again, I know just from talking to people, they would just want to give them a big hug and never let go, right? And Jesus says, don't cling to me. Go tell the brothers. Go tell the family. In other words, go. Be about what is good and find this new purpose. And Mary does. Mary lets go and goes out with a new purpose. 
She goes out and lives what she has been, the story she's been told, the story that is standing right in front of her, that Christ is alive. She goes to the brothers first. You won't believe this, guys. I'm going to tell you five times because you're not going to believe it. And then she continues to be a, an evangelist, a witness to the early Christian communities all over the area. I'm sure she continued to take on the responsibility of financial assets. I'm sure she continued to be that astute dialogue partner with a good uh, mind and a great listening ear. But more than anything, she was the story bearer and teller. And she did that by living it. She didn't cling, but she lived what, what Jesus would have her live. A new purpose of telling the story. Jesus is the love at the center of all of the testimony. When we encounter the holy with the personal, transformation takes hold. We testify to love and live. And this can be true for us here today as well. I've been just so reflective <laughs> over the last year um, since our last time meeting here. So reflective of what ministry has happened in our midst in 2020 of all years. And today, I'm amazed at what we might go forth with. What is the purpose into which we will live? What is the mission that we will follow? Last week, I asked the questions that we might um, consider. How has God's mission for Stevensville empowered love to be realized this year? And how does money so generously given now impact people right now? This week, as we testify to what's good and discover our responsibility, our action, our joy, and ways of being generous, I want to ask these questions. How will God's mission for Stevensville United Methodist Church encourage us to love in the future? How do we give so that what is good is shared and experienced deeply and widely? The leaders of this church have considered these questions, considered what it means to testify to love, to testify to what is good and what that looks like in responsibility and action and joy. The missional goals that we put in the glad titer of October kind of take on practical expressions as well as ongoing faith formation. So let me share these as a goal as missional goals that we might live into in this coming year. We want to continue to serve the community with our space and our resources. For AA, Al-Anon, WIC, Blood Drives, the Scouts to meet in this space. We want to continue to worship with two services on Zoom with YouTube recordings. We want to care for families and their children through Sapphire Early Learning Center, through classes, through having a safe place in the midst of pandemic. We want to build our faith formation through studies like the Wednesday morning Bible study, bereavement groups, fearless conversations, radical justice conversations, and Financial Peace University. We want to re-roof this historic building we want to finish the construction of a new building that will include a fellowship hall, a new kitchen, and many classrooms. We want to uplift traditional, um, the traditions that we hold and create new rituals of meaning. So this year, hanging of the greens is not going to look like it has in the past, but we're still going to do it because it matters and it brings meaning. We want to build mentoring programs for all ages. We want to cultivate spiritual depth through worship, spiritual practices, and prayer. And we want to, to weave together contemplation with action so that social justice results into mentoring, scholarships, and other connections. It has a number, right? It has a number of 160,000 
but it more has a, an experience, a, a purpose to which we're called. Just like Mary Magdalene was called and said, go and tell others. Go with this new purpose. Go with new life. As Jesus called out Lazarus, he called out his name, and Lazarus walked out of the tomb. So when Jesus called Mary's name, here she came into a new life with the risen Christ. When we hold these things together, these ideas of how we live, our slogans, our bumper stickers for life, when we recognize the saints among us, the Mary Magdalene's who not only... Um, had the experience of love, but lived it. And when we're given a mission, a goal to live into, a purpose that God has bestowed upon our hearts, it's like the trifecta that will allow us to live into what is good, to testify to that love and live it. I pray that we can embrace the spirit of Mary Magdalene, who testified to love in the hard times and the good times, in Jesus' life, death, and new life, in the joy and generosity, and in the invaluable dedication of her responsibilities. For she was transformed and an empowered person who was entrusted with a fuller purpose that would change the world. One testimony at a time, one act at a time. May we testify to love and live.